dive into everything about the liberal media and their role in fomenting a sex panic, um, I just want to kind of hit on the basics of what the satanic panic is. Uh, I think lots of people probably have a general idea. Um, but, you know, there were thousands of alleged satanic sexual abuse cases that happened in the 80s. No evidence whatsoever that any of this ever occurred. Um, I, I I feel like there have been a few books uh, over the last few years that have kind of tried to, you know, exhume what happened. Um, I know Richard Beck wrote a book called We Believe the Children, which I really enjoyed. Um, but can you give us an overview of what the satanic panic was? And specifically, like, how did the McMartin trial sort of kick it off? And what were the kinds of like social and economic conditions that precipitated this? This is this is a big question, and um, I mean the the actual ball started rolling in Kern County, um, involving uh, accusations that were started by I think a schizophrenic relative of a family, and then the children were coerced into giving testimony against their parents, and then pretty soon. The whole thing had ballooned into a into a huge uh, into a huge case. It's, it uh, soon followed to uh, McMartin Preschool, which was another enormous uh, legal case. Um, and within a few weeks, it seemed eminently plausible to large numbers of serious people that an underground cabal of Satanists had been operating out of preschools for years, if not decades, had been undetected by authorities all this time and were using their preschool activities as a front for sexually abusing children, um, in some cases supposedly ritually sacrificing them and so on. Um, you ask about the background. I mean, the background is complicated. Uh, yeah, typical academic response, right? It's complicated, but it's it's maybe not altogether that complicated, right? I mean, the the, the libertarian ethos of the 1960s was followed by a, a cultural retrenchment in the 1970s. So you had a lot of increasingly, I don't know, if the 60s were all about sexual liberation, the 70s started to see retrenchment and sex negative attitudes being expressed not only by evangelical fundamentalists who had always been sex negative, uh, let's be clear, but also certain variants of feminism joined the, that and, and were involved in campaigns against pornography and so on. So. There were also anti-gay backlashes that happened in the 70s. And, and as you might know, I mean, you're too young to remember it. I think those of us who lived through it remember very well how, how conservative figures would dangle small children in front of the public and say, you know, do you really trust homosexuals to be around your children? Um, so you had a whole, you had a series of things leading up to this. Um, and then there's this one little extra factor that I think you have to take into account, or two, we'll say, right? One of them is that there was a book that was popular with therapists and social workers uh, called Michelle Remembers, and it, it was the conversations between a psychiatrist and his patient in which they supposedly unearthed her history of having been abused by Satanists as a child. And this became a kind of an underground, I don't know, I, it wasn't a bestseller, but it was a bestseller in some circles. Unfortunately, these were all the, the circles that you, you wouldn't want this book to be circulated among. I mean, social workers read it. Uh, some psychiatrists and psychologists read it. And there, so the book contains a blueprint for soliciting accusations of satanic ritual abuse and for uncovering memories using suggestive interview techniques 
and for uncovering memories using hypnosis. Now, I mean, you know, the whole thing about hypnosis and uh, once you've solicited a memory uh, the hypnosis, you can't really tell whether it's a real memory or a, or a false memory, right? Uh, um, so here you have, you have a Kern County, McBarton Preschool, make the national news, all of the social workers in America, well, not all of them, but a lot of them, a lot of drinks, a lot of other people involved have this Bible that they can consult how to look for signs and symptoms. And pretty soon they were unearthing evidence of, of vast ritual abuse, largely through coaxed, coerced, and, and leading uh, questioning of small children who are malleable and, and easy to manipulate that way. Um, the other factor, you, I mean, so, so you've, got, you've got backlash, you've got retrenchment, you've got all of that stuff going on. You've also got this, this pamphlet that, that helps find this. And as a result, it seemed eminently plausible that this stuff was happening, right? Um, the other side is, though, if, I, if, I'm remember, if I'm remembering my dates correctly, God, I did this research like a decade ago. So like, you know, you might have to help me out a little bit. Um, Ronald Reagan's welfare cuts take effect. And then mm -hmm. within weeks or months, you get the, the sudden explosion of all of this stuff happening. So it, it's, it's also in a context... It's hard to draw a hard and fast rule, but this seems to have possibly something to do with the retrenchment of welfare uh, supports for families with small children. Um, add to this parental nervousness about sending kids, their small kids off to, uh, to, uh, to be taken care of at daycare and you kind of have a recipe for a mass epidemic of of uh, of accusation and panic and, mm -hmm. and anxiety. Mm -hmm. Oh, can you talk about like how how did the media help stoke this panic? And really, in general, even today, like, do you think the media is always playing a role in stoking these moral and sex panics? You're going to make me mad here. I mean, the media performed a, a, a really awful disservice during the satanic ritual abuse, certainly. Uh, the New York Times, Newsweek, Time, newspapers in California basically stoked the flames. Um, they uncritically reported accusations they uncritically reported expert witnesses testimony that was based on michelle remembers and and um i mean I, I, you, you I, of course i'm i'm talking to jen and paul and they're too young <laughs> to remember if you talk to parents i i'm in grad school at this time right if you talk if you talked to parents, they were genuinely frightened by this stuff. They, 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 were, they were anxious. They believed the charges. They believed the accusations. It seemed plausible to them that this might happen to their children. And, um, and the, you know, the media could, the media had become yellower and yellow, I mean, yellow tabloid journalism. The media had been becoming progressively tabloidized, I think, uh, in the late 1970s into the 1980s. Um, but there were no, there were no breaks applied. There, were, there was no plausible uh, doubt ever expressed. Um, it, it went forward for several years before you could see signs of skepticism in, in the coverage. 
So I, I wonder if you can expand on that a little by talking about what gives rise to sex panics in general. And this again is going back to your book. Um, you connect it, you connect sex panics in your book to just, you know, the incredibly punitive nature of the United States and the expansion of the carceral state. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I try to connect these these tendencies with uh, the rise of mass incarceration, which they play you know, it's kind of in tandem with, with it, right? Um, what causes anything? It's a, it causes are hard. And I, I, I probably approach this more like a starian than like a sociologist, um, although I am an anthropologist by training. Um, every sex panic probably has different alignments of forces behind them. So if you look at sex panics of the 19th century, um, they're almost all about the protection of white women and children from the supposed predations of black, brown, and yellow men. Um, and that's one very strong motif and it, and it happens over and over again. And it's one of the reasons that rape accusations could play such an outsized role in the enforcement of Jim Crow uh, in, well into the 20th century and, and so on. So that's one type, right? Uh, if you look at another type, though, uh, a different kind of configuration starts in the 1930s. You had uh, maybe because you had large numbers of unemployed white uh, men on the land, on the loose, um, homeless and wandering. Um, you had the expression of certain kinds of anxieties about that. But in, in the new run of sex panics that start in the 1930s and then are interrupted by World War II and then really take off at the end of World War II, when, when, when things come back to normal, as it were, um, you, you, have a, you have a different cast of villains. It's mostly white men. Um, it's, mostly, it's mostly homosexual white men in, in, in actual fact, right? Um, so, so you get a different kind of sex panic that starts in the McCarthy era. What's weird about the 80s is that most of the accusations were made against women, like a lot of the, a, a very large percentage, not maybe not half, but a large percentage of the accusations were made against women because they were school teachers. Um, so every one of these will look a little bit different. Some of them happen when you have, you know, economic boom. Some of them happen when you have economic bust. It's, so it's hard to make, I, I, this is why I say I, I like to think about it like a historian rather than like somebody looking for rules and laws, right? Uh, you, you try to assemble the factors and take them in place. But I think one of the things that is, rec how do I put this? Moral panics of which sex panics are a subset are a recurring feature of American political life. And I think that's because, well, for a variety of reasons. One, we're uh, in the United States, we're constitutionally blocked from making welfare the pivot of governance. Like if you look at, look at our constitution, it's, it's, a, it's a mess from the 1700s, right? Um, and it's, it tells you government shall not, government shall make no law, Congress shall make no law, the state cannot do this, the state cannot do that. So what, what you have in the constitution is a series of impediments for putting governance on the basis that governments eventually found everywhere else in the democratic world. In other words, everywhere else in the democratic world, governance revolves around the idea of providing for social welfare. 
the, the well-being of the citizens, the, the social welfare. Uh, that, that took a beating with neoliberalism, by the way, but, but you could speak generally and say that that, that was the pivot of, of governance. In the U.S., welfare is your own damn business. Like you're, you're, you're responsible for your own well-being, your, the pursuit of happiness and the, in the, in, in the declaration and all of that is a private affair. And government has very high barriers to getting into any of that. The flimsiest of pretexts and the constitution allow for it. The interstate commerce rule. I mean, almost, almost the entire welfare state in the U.S., what, what flimsy welfare state we have was built on the back of that little flimsy piece of the Constitution. It's a, it's a weird history, right? So, so, we, so how do political elites pitch their case for governance? I would argue that they often have to find some kind of an emergency. They look for an emergency. They, it, it's an emergency. We have to do such and such. You know, fortunately, we had Franklin Roosevelt as president in the 30s, and we had an emergency. And even though he starts out as a conservative Democrat, in, in many regards, he begins to address the emergency, and he builds a series of, of institutions that, that still survive to this day, albeit in weakened form somewhat. Um, so, so here's a, a long argument about causes. America. Moral panic, sex panic are as American as apple pie. They may be more American than apple pie, actually. They're, they're <laughs> kind of built into our weird system of governance. Liberal reformers, conservative reactions, everybody makes use of, of moral panic to make their cases. And, uh, you know... That's that. That may be, if I'm right, that's the that may be the ultimate backdrop of of a lot of how a lot of this plays out. If you like-